So, I think before we kick off, we should all probably say who we are and what we do. Um, and I think it's a really interesting moment for uh, self-definition, which I think has to be the starting point of any real conversation about identity. Um, I, in fact, do not consider myself a theatre director. I consider myself an artist who chooses theatre making as part of their practice, uh, but also includes film direction and writing within that. Not everyone needs to be as highfalutin <laughs> as I just attempted to be, but uh, I think that's a really important thing of like how you claim titles and how you reclaim them and redistribute them and pick them up and throw them away uh, sometimes. So we're going to start down that end. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Naomi. I usually use the term theatre designer, but I would prefer theatre artist or sonographer, um, which sometimes feels a bit harder to use in this industry. Uh, I'm Raja Shakiri, and I am a designer, theatre maker, filmmaker, uh, performer, you name it, I've done it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Leo, uh, my full name is Lucy J. Skilbeck, uh, they, them. I'm a writer, director, artist, mainly in theatre, and also other things. <laughs> Hi, I'm David Shearing, I'm an uh, artist, I'd say again but also interested in the direction um, of theatre events. So using the, I often make my own work to make design-led performance experiences. Cool, that was all really fucking highfalutin, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right, steps up game. Uh, so I think, I think so much of design is about um, bridges. I think it's about design as a bridge between the textual and physical existence of an idea. I think that it's a bridge between the stage and the audience, between the auditorium and the outside world. And and I know that in my own practice, designers are very often a bridge slash a shield between a director and a writer. Uh, and um, very often, sort of, you know, anyway, canoe on missile. Uh, and, uh, and of course, and between creators and production. And that is something that is evolving sometimes uh, very, very slowly sometimes quickly, uh, and, and we are changing our understanding of what the job is um, and where it takes place and who gets to do it. Uh, and so I guess uh, my first question, which is open to anyone, otherwise I will start pointing, <laughs> uh, is, is how is the role changing? How is the role of both design and the designer, because those two things are separate, how is it changing in your view of the world at the moment? <laughs> I mean, I guess I look at you because saying sonography for me was almost the key of a lot of designers and their sonographers as well. But I don't know if people understand the term sonography. I don't. This is new to me. So if anyone can explain what sonography is, I'm just like, sure, don't look like an idiot. Um, <laughs> right. I guess, I mean, so, do you want to say? Um, I try. I mean, yeah. I mean, I guess like definitions, everyone kind of makes their own version of it um, mm -hmm. and you adopt different definitions. And I've adopted many different definitions from my kind of role in theatre, I guess, over the time that I've done it. Um, uh, because that is inherently linked to your work identity and mm -hmm. your creative identity. But uh, for me, sonographer links more to the entire visual world. There's something a bit more wholesome about it, I guess, um, in in considering the visual dramaturgy of the show, um, mm. which is why I like the term. It doesn't feel like it's limited to set and costume, which uh, almost feel like they describe design in quite an object way yeah. mm -hmm. and less so um, yeah, no, a dramaturgical way. Yeah. But then, because so, I think me and, me and Amy did a show together at the beginning of this year um, with a uh, the performance artist, I guess you'd call them, uh, Rachel Young. And that was a, a revelation for me for exactly that designer as visual dramaturg. And actually in the like glorious abandoning of all like patriarchal structures of like work creation, uh, you know, it was just like everyone's just a collaborator and you just have like your own areas of expertise. But that thing of sort of serving the work as a holistic, yeah. i.e. get rid of all the penises in the room thing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, I mean, it might have been a happy coincidence, but uh, yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, um, yeah, like I really, really enjoyed that process because it everybody felt on the same page, on the same plane. Um, it decentralised the obsession I think we have in theatre here of the writer and the director. Um, 
sort of being at the top of the pile and then the rest of the creative team and then production team like even lower um it felt like a true collaboration everybody was essentially co-creators and it was a really fruitful environment to design in i think um it can really help design go far when mm. you've got that understanding between people um but also it's a really interesting thing about what happens if you prioritize design within the creation of an idea so for example, Naomi uh, created a dress entirely made out of like meters upon meters of rubber cabling, which meant that the composers had to make music to fit the fullest brief of that costume. And we had to kind of construct, lit you know, textual ideas to fit that because the challenge was the design and how we could meet that. And then there are other bits where you're just like, Do you know what, I just need like a pair of pants because I need yeah. to not have my vagina out on stage or whatever. Do you know what I mean? And but being able to sort of move between both. Um, I'm going to swing to my left. Uh. Leo, <laughs> um, as a sort of, you know, obviously we as directors, I guess. <laughs> uh, uh, and how have you felt the kind of director designer relationship change in your practice? Well, I think like, I come at any project as a whole already. So, like, if I'm a writer, maker, I think director. So, when I, was, I was just thinking then about, um, I make this play called Joan, which is part drag king, cabaret, part theatre show. And that design was all, always needed from the off before a designer came in. It uh, needed to be able to exist in clubs, queer clubs, women's clubs or working people's clubs, uh, theatres. And so from from the off, that was always going to be the deal. Um, and I always wanted the audience to be part of the design. So it's in the round and uh, the audience can see each other at all times. And then the action kind of happens in the middle. And it needs to like exist within like a pub that could be really tiny or like a huge theatre space. And so from that we yeah, we knew from the off like that the design was a really central thing. And I think um that has already destabilized what it is to have like the designer come in and be like, and this is your design. And partly partly I think that would actually be really liberating because it never worked like that. <laughs> I think actually having like someone be like, you know. I don't know, I think I always work really collaboratively anyway mm -hmm. with everyone in the room. So like the drag king who performed it was had never really worked in theatre and it was main, only new queer spaces and queer bars. And so if we then put that on like an end on setting, that just would not have served the performer well mm -hmm. at all. And so it was like about who we wanted to be in the room, so what spaces it had to go mm -hmm. into. Who we, the audience kind of become the set, so how we put ourselves in those spaces and working with a designer that can roll with whatever comes up in the room very quickly um, and and be able to be very responsive to everything that's happening uh, and then go away and then come back and then go away and come back and be in the room all the time. Mm. Um, so it was definitely like, it was concept led, the design. And I can't really imagine working in a different way to that. Yeah, you do have to do that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, David, this because um, you were talking downstairs, and I'm totally going to out you about this now. Um, uh, we're just about what it feels like to be a designer, sort of who chooses to work or not work within institutions, and the kind of expectations on designers that walking through the doors of an institution mean you have to work a certain way, and you have to meet certain deadlines and like methods of working and. There are those of us, myself included, who just go, nope, <laughs> don't fancy that at all. But how do we bend institutions, I guess, to accept just more like lateral and creative ways of thinking about design as a process? I think, come back to the term of sonography a little bit in the way that often I think about it as the, the operation, the orchestration of the materials of performance, which includes actors, audience, light, sound, objects, space, time, <laughs> venues kind of coming together. Um, and I think in recent years there has been a shift a lot to think about audience engagement and their relationship to the work. And when it's nice to hear about from a sort of directorial point of view, well actually where that placement is really important, that's partly about the design, the spatial dynamic between you, your audience and the performer. Uh, and I think it's that consideration of those elements I think is really exciting. And then also the, the wider thinking about spaces of performance. So not just theatre uh, design or work that happens in the space, but it could happen in the foyers or the box offices and how they 
frame and become a part of the eventness of design. Um, and designers often thinking about design as an event uh, and the spectacle of that event, and that's been quite a, a trend, I would say, that's happened in the last decade. Um, and I think sometimes it's just saying there are other ways into venues, and there are other ways that the venues can move out. <laughs> mm. And I think it's not just trying to, you know, designers from the outside trying to get in, but actually that porous relationship to well, what happens if we just shifted and put the focus on the audience. I think it's a nice way of thinking about it, rather than like, oh, we don't make. I have had venues tell me that they, oh, we, oh, we're a building-based theatre company, so we only make building-based work. And I'm like, well, is that good enough? And actually, are by limiting that view, what are you missing out on in terms of other spatial relationships that can still be text driven um, and it can still use, uh, but the design is coming through that relation. Um, so I'm like, there's lots of other ways. Um, I'm like, you've done the most glorious segue to my next question. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, holy shit, this is going to work. Uh, it's, uh, incidentally, I'd like to say that like, as a black Muslim woman in the arts, I have been on about 20,000 panels in my life. Uh, because I tick a lot of boxes. Uh, I have never chaired one, so this is really exciting. <laughs> I'm just like, so much fucking power. This is great. Anyway, uh, which, is, which is, is about that. It's about, um, can we change our understanding of where the physical boundaries of design end? And, and, and that, to me, is about, I often feel like the disjunct between what work is happening and where it's happening, and uh, more on this later, but about the audiences that are coming to it, the, is there a thing about the second I walk, you know, we at the Young Vic, I say the most important people in that building are front of house staff because that's your first experience of that piece of art is you're going to get your ticket. But actually, what if we begin to think about that in, in an aesthetic um, realm? I don't know if anyone's going to chip in on this, but yeah, just that idea of, uh, and particularly I think with, um, you know, I remember when like the yard popped up as a, as a, as a space and that whole thing of like the architecture and the kind of philosophy of that building and the aesthetic of, and how that's like negotiated itself in the last five years, I think. Do you know what I mean? So yeah, what happens if we stop thinking about like designers ending at the cross arch? Not that any of us have seen the cross arch in a really long time, but uh, I bring back the cross arch, I'm well up for it. Um, I, don't, I don't think you can. I don't think you can end the design there. Um, and as scenographers or designers or makers, it, it, it goes throughout the whole piece. So, um, yeah, I wouldn't see it as an, an infinite. <laughs> Sometimes it is an infinite because, you, you know, I mean, for me, anyway, on a personal level, projects that I've done more recently, um, I've got Misty and Nine Nights, uh, which is very much bringing in very, very diverse audiences into seven venues. You are segueing seriously to my next question. Oh, this is a lot, honestly. Ahead, it's like I planned. <laughs> this is amazing. Um, <laughs> So and when you were talking about, um, I guess, the foyers and stuff like that, I think for Nine Night and Paul is there, <laughs> who kind of, you know, <laughs> encouraged all this. Uh, we worked with a photographer who's been photographing Nine Nights um, events, or, yeah, I guess, celebrations as they are, for the past 50 years um, in the UK, and he put on the exhibition as well at the same, at the same time. Um, and I think it is kind of, I guess it's a social responsibility for us to kind of feed more um, to the piece itself, to the work. So, yeah. anybody else mm -hmm. else? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just thinking like, if theatres are publicly funded in some way, then they belong to everybody. And I think it's partly the foyer's job or the beginning of like what it is to make that as inclusive as possible. So, like, if I'm going to a space, it's like, yes, what will be the programming be or what will the shows be on, but also like, mm -hmm. will it be safe? really as mm -hmm. one thing or like uh will there be gender neutral bathrooms uh will uh i feel like i shouldn't be there will i feel stupid in that venue will i feel welcomed in that venue how mm -hmm. are people going to speak to me and i think like uh again with the young big having all the flags outside that's like a stamp of being like you will yes have a good time here b you mm -hmm. will be safe here or you'll be welcomed here um and i totally and I think that can come from or be driven by the artists. Like as artists, mm. we can drive stuff and we can drive change. If like, uh, so say with um, Bear Proposal was a show that the Young Show did, like we needed to have adequate signage and bathrooms in for that show so that when people come here, they come and see the work, they feel good or they feel welcomed. And like the arts can, or the artists I think can drive 
can be the drivers and the instigators in that and be like if you want this show this is what you you will have to do and like I think yeah having the photos and stuff is great as well like because then maybe people who come in we we tour at the moment we've got a touring show we have an exhibition with them I think maybe you want to come and see the show maybe you don't but but you can access it through photos Mm -hmm. or you can access it in a different way we don't just have to be like the only way we can access this is if you buy a ticket for like 20 quid and you watch this thing for three hours you know it's actually like you could watch it online like the stuff you're doing all the videos you know and or you could watch it through a photo exhibition or a, a podcast or there's other ways of of doing the play i think or doing the show word and yeah. I, I, I particularly just i think um in in the interaction between sort of the architecture of spaces um and the people that reside within them and i think one of the interesting things about the young vic is that obviously they've got a big hoo-ha for being you know fancy fancy building um uh i think one seventy five in 2007 i want to say um but there's a really interesting thing about when you walk into someone then you go yeah but it doesn't work to make art in loads of ways and that thing about actually does the bricks and if the bricks and mortar doesn't serve to make the art you want to make what gives first mm. do you know what i mean yeah, and and yeah. that, that's the really difficult thing and i think particularly with that thing of trying to like understand architecture like oh this is a brick wall but it's a glory you know like who hasn't been to the almeida and marveled at the back wall of the almeida and gone oh that's nice have a bit of curved brick oh. and yeah oh i'd love to like that <laughs> um is it i also really appreciate this is a design festival because this is the best lit um, <laughs> panel I've seen in ages. I'm just like, oh, this is oh, you look great. Uh, anyway, um, yeah, does anybody have anything else to say um, about I think the <coughs> referencing the nine night and the exhibition um, that went with it, mm-hmm. I was having a conversation with someone yesterday about uh, bringing new audiences into theatre and people that don't want to come to the theatre because they feel they might not get it. Mm-hmm. Um, and how that sort of extra contextual information that you get in galleries on the wall for free, Mm -hmm. but in theatre you get in programmes for Mm -hmm. a very expensive Mm -hmm. price, um, can deepen your understanding and experience of a show. Whether you read that before or after the show is, I think should be up to you. Um, But yeah, stuff like things going on in the foyer or perhaps within the auditorium itself Mm -hmm. in Mm -hmm. some ways that extend from the performance of the stage. Mm -hmm. Um, can make people feel more comfortable with the kind of whole engagement of going to see a performance and it not just being like you go and take your seat and immediately you're, you're sort of separated from that space that the actors are on. I think that comes back a lot to the diversity. I think we've seen huge shifts in the vis- vis- visual representation of people on the stage, but the, the voices behind that haven't changed. David, I could kiss you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and actually what you're saying here is about an embodied knowledge that you might have of a space that you can change as an artist or you would have a sensitivity towards to allow people to access that building. And even if it's the dissemination of the, the work mm-hmm. through various aesthetic means or the knowledge of that work through the programme in some way. And I think that is the importance of backstage. <laughs> yeah. Um, artists mm-hmm. um, and the need to shift that diversity, need of different voices there, because um, it's about embodied experience. It's all about the visual part of it, actually. Yeah. But for me, synopsis is about the the experience of it, and if we're talking <coughs> about buildings, design, experience of it, that that's what we're talking about as living. And I think there's something really interesting, and and, and Roger, I, I I think to um, Misty, which I saw when it was on a at the bush and and (coughs) the power of design to change who is in the audience um Mm. what was when me and Naomi worked on um nightclub which is the grace jones show it was a really in many ways for me heartbreaking experience that because of the nature of the show and because of the nature of making shows in small spaces and it sold out a really long time before we got anywhere the audience was made almost entirely of white people um and we were like huh we made a show about black women like by predominantly black women and and the wrong people are seeing it um, not that they didn't get something glorious out of it, but what I found really interesting about those images that I saw, woefully undercredited, I hasten to add, um, of the set of Misty, is that I was like, fuck, this is the first time in a long time a design has made me want to see something, because it was such a provocation for like, mm-hmm. fuck, this is not the normal, this is not my expectation, do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. fuck, this has elevated the game. And I really felt a very palpable sense in Misty of like, this is not 
we're all here because we're intrigued mm -hmm. and we're intrigued what's in the box <laughs> 20 million orange balloons like when's that gonna happen <laughs> uh, so, but that's how pretty cool <laughs> yeah and how and will he ever keep his shirt on oh. <laughs> um, uh, Arinza Kenny has just been uh, announced in a show at the Young Vic, and I have asked for a contractual obligation for him to get that. <laughs> Your nipples have no place in Arthur Miller. Fuck off. Yeah. Um, find a way. Uh, you yeah, will find a way. I was going to say that's the perks of the job. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, but I just think that thing about like it felt like such a clear signalling of like this is something different. This is not what you expect from the shitty marketing copy. Do you know what I mean? Of yeah. like, actually, I'm going to give you a visual way in about like, if you see the show, it feels like this nipples and balloons. Great. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, much more than yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely much more than that. Um, I guess with Misty, it is very much a collaborative process. So um, I guess we started conversations in October, and, and I was given a snippet of something that was performed three years before um, it's a 15 minute piece and half a script off you go, land it somewhere. Um, and I think it, I mean, it was just the whole process of, of pushing through the rehearsal process, through tech, through all the previews to kind of get to these images. Um, uh, yes, I mean, it's just, it, it tells the story um, and it is just quite fragmented. So I guess the, the, the imagery that was obtained at the end, um, sort of, for me, it was just aiding to kind of take us from jumping from place to person to, um, what, what the narrative is telling us. So, yeah. And do you, do you have a sort of conscious, what's the word I want to call it? Do you have a sort of conscious process within that about what you wanted to give or, or not give? Because I think there's a very interesting, for those who haven't seen Missy, there's a very interesting provocation within it, which is about the show that you think you're going to see. Mm. And then actually, Arinze keeps undermining that and going, oh, I'm just going to take a step outside and go, yeah. it's really hard to write a play, um, which is actually my favourite thing about it. But yeah, I mean, um, that's dramaturgically, I guess. That was the, where it, where the piece itself went to. Um, what we get to see at different stages is very much, I mean, I guess it's, it's where we start and where what the journey is and where we end up. Um, yeah, the, that is pretty much collaborative. There's no, you know, no, no one person in that team can say, because, you know, you've got sound and lighting and it's just literally how the space is carved up mm. um, in that piece, so. Um, David, your thoughts on that, just about the potential to, and I think Leo also, there's the potential design to get different, like I went to Travis's show yeah, at the Hackney Showrooms on um, last week, not well, last week, Travis Alabanza has done a show, the trans artist has done a show called Burgers at the Hackney Showrooms, which is great, and um, there was a very interesting thing about that, about actually being in an audience that was full of queer people of colour, trans audience, um, and feeling like, yeah, it's because there was something in how this show was portrayed that made us feel like this was for us. Um, and so just sort of interesting, again, how do we go outside of the construct of you have to have already bought a ticket and be in the auditorium to feel like you have access to this thing? I think it's, yeah, they had amazing imagery with that already. True. Um, I think it's when you look at that poster and you see you see yourself reflected in some way on that, be that for Quidditch or Champions or wherever that is. I think also it's about um, where those things are chatted about. So if, if if it's like in, I'm just thinking, I can only like talk from my own experience, so it's like uh, that I, I heard about that show, one from Travis, but mainly through like Bar Whatever, which is a club that happens in the Abbey too. Mm. Um, and like where you are, where you are, Advertising is the right word, but where people are talking about this work and how do you take that from being a theatre thing into being like a community thing? So like you know, you go there knowing a all those things that I spoke about before, like will I have a good time at the show? But also like it becomes more of a community event rather than um, a theatre show. And so like I think that as well. Again with Joan, that that uh, is in tonight on in her school. In, in Hull and I think like that is in for that it's not really about what the show is even it's more like oh there's, there's an event that is happening in that community for us now um, and it just happens to be a queer show and I think like it's about how you get the word out in different channels that aren't your usual like theatre 
be split. I don't even know what people read, like, <laughs> channels, do you know what I mean? Or, like, po- yeah, Twitter, like, Twitter mm-hmm. and podcasts and all those other ways of, and queer bars and uh, all the other ways that people interact with each other that are outside of a building, essentially. Mm. But I often think, like, um, there are so many things that the um, the mainstream institutions can learn from the truest communities of queer mm-hmm. theatre making and, like, seriously, they would shit a fucking brick if they could only figure it out. Um, <laughs> do, do you know what I mean? That sense of, like, we're all here because we care and we're here yeah. because we believe in the, the artist and, and, yeah. and the making of it. Um, boo hiss. But, so. like, Travis does that thing, uh, not in this one, but where they leave a, a front row... Um, they don't let anyone sit in the front row and then they're like uh, trans people come to the front or uh, queer people come up, come to the front and like it and there's something about like creating space for that to be okay and to be like I see you I welcome you um, and also as a performer I guess or, or as soon as as an audience member when I go it's like I will be there for you I will show up for you like there's an act a political act of like I will sit on the front row for you like so that when you look at you're not just looking at lots of cis people you know so there was a really interesting thing that happened with misty in the west end that i got an invite to and, and couldn't go um where uh, daniel clear and anthony welsh took it over for one mm-hmm. night and basically invited black people to just go and be part of mm-hmm. this magnificence and and i sent i sent a missive uh who's a young black man who works for young vic and couldn't otherwise mm-hmm. afford to go i was like here here's my freebie and and he was so moved by it, not just because he was watching such black excellence on stage, but to be part of his own community. And so that's, mm-hmm. I think, why I'm interested in the potential to encourage, you know, there are so few places in this political day and age where we are encouraged and or not demonised to gather, mm-hmm. to gather and be together and to recognise. It's not the fucking cinema, it's not fucking Netflix. Do you know what I mean? It's like, mm-hmm. let's be here together and embrace mm-hmm. the communality mm-hmm. of it. So I'm just, I'm sort of fascinated by that potential to say, well, actually, you can give visual clues and, like, mm-hmm breadcrumbs mm-hmm. to get those people in the room, like physical people, do you know what I mean? It's not just about getting fucking actors on stage. It's okay to create work that's for and with a particular group of people and actually to be brave and say, uh, as opposed to this top down, this culture is for other, you should come to this. It's fine to say this is a particular group of people we're going to make that work for and with. Um, so some of the stuff I've done is a bit of a leap, but outside of venues where I've worked with just a few community groups, and often we talk, we, we try and get rid of the term community and talk about just people. So it could be the people that ride a number five bus that through the city. And that has a particular geographic and economic concern because of where it goes in a bus, not because of a particular uh, type or, of person, but actually thinking about people in different ways and to make space for that imagination in when we're designing and making work. Um, and also that idea of buying into theatre as a ticket, an exchange, it comes with a whole host of other issues. Um, and then thinking about those as mechanisms. So I did a piece called The Weather Cafe, where it was, we pitched it totally as a cafe. So we sold it as a cafe opening. We didn't call it artwork. We didn't want to put people off. And actually, that was a really magical thing to find out, oh, OK, people buy into the cafe. We understand the rules of that because it's familiar. And so other familiar rules, I think, are really interesting design potentials of um, without the dreaded pop-up <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, cool. yeah, yeah. Just popping up yeah but it's you know, i find it really interesting what you say about like the idea of like be selling it as an art process is somewhat off-putting there was a fascinating thing at, i think york theater royal this is like a really odd thing where they advertised for a chef for the uh, theater's restaurant cafe and got no applications <laughs> They sent out exactly the same advert, but removed the words theatre and got over 300 applications. I was like, God damn, we are toxic. <laughs> <laughs> was like, but there's a the thing, isn't it? Like, it's fucking off-putting. I like, in so many ways. wouldn't drop something off into the theatre for me because they didn't know they could go into it. And I was like, yeah. oh, gosh, I forget that I hang out and have the privilege of moving around these spaces. And it's, it's such an even obvious thing to keep having to say, but don't understand those rules <laughs> yeah word and you know also like loads of theater is shit and like unfriendly and like, you know, like why would you no you didn't say that <laughs> um in case you thought this was all off the cuff <laughs> i had notes um and now to slide to uh, my favorite part of the uh, evening which is it it is it is both churlish and unrealistic to not um acknowledge the optics of design and that you know and i say this you know my boss is a black man 
when he employed me, I was like, "Ooh, there can be two, blimey!" Uh, and uh, and and then I I acknowledged kind of programming a season, and suddenly you, uh, and you, you're sort of the poster children of diversity, and and you acknowledge your season where the entirety of your creative teams are white, cis, generally straight, not entirely people, and we go, "Huh, okay, all right, that's 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 a thing. Generally, that's a thing that we have to." acknowledge and 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 it's the thing that i think me and Kwame argue about the most which is when does identity matter and when doesn't it and uh and we talk a lot about well who's do, you know i'm not an essentialist i do not believe that you necessarily have to have a lived experience of a thing in order to make art about it um and i think we talk a lot about the authenticity of writers directors and actors uh, and we don't talk a lot about the authenticity of uh designers or should we? I don't know. And that's where that's going to be the next section <laughs> of this, very clearly. Uh, oh, shit. Uh, and yeah, does, does the identity of the designer matter? And, and Leo, this is going to be your favourite question, of course, my name is as well, which is what happens when you are asked to take on an aesthetic or a lens that does not belong to your lived experience? How do you negotiate clearly through endless research but like how do you emotionally and kind of spiritually engage with with that that's just three questions because i couldn't bear to separate them out i'm sorry <laughs> um i think it's a lot about <coughs> empathy and heavy research um i don't know speaking from the experience of doing night clubbing um with rachel who's a black artist making a uh, work about the experience um of being a black woman and uh i felt very conscious I mean, I've done three projects with her and we've discovered we have a great collaboration um, that works on a personal level um, and feeds the work, but also my understanding of that process with her is to listen as closely as possible, to try and empathise as much as possible, um, to discuss how to translate her experiences into design and into design that people can find a sort of physical reaction to and embodiment of, um, but also know the limitations of translating to. Um, yeah, that's like that sort of process. But equally, I think uh, it's, it's really important to employ people in creative teams and not just one person and especially in the structures we have the sort of hierarchical structures we have in this country I think it's really important um, to employ a variety of people in the creative team that do have some sort of lived experience of the show or the, the themes that you are exploring um, because I think and sometimes I've seen when that that's just the designer or that's just say the sound designer or someone. Mm. And in the structures that we have, I don't think that's good enough because their voice can't always necessarily get onto stage in a direct way. Um, and until we either break that structure and have a more collaborative and sort of co-creator um, space or, you know, employed directors and writers and designers and design, everybody exactly um that have lived that experience then yeah people aren't going to get that in all of the forms that you possibly in the instinctual way and the intellectual way that you can in theater mm. Roger, it's particularly interesting because I would say that you have been the designer behind like two of the most radically black experiences in theater and and I mean to say that Misty is a radically black play, and Nine Night is radically in the West End, <laughs> being like the only second ever play by a black person to, to be in the black, black British writer, sorry, to be in the West End. Mm -hmm. um, but you, of course, yourself are not black. I think I'm safe to say that, it's fine. But, uh, do you know what I mean? but actually, that's oh, really oh, interesting. That's well, you can, be <laughs> you can be politically black if you ask nicely. But, uh, and, but there's something really interesting in that, isn't there, about like, being asked to be part of a sort of like black avant gardeness but also being asked to be yes. essentially authentically black yes. visually and yes. how do you negotiate those two different things um i mean i get for me i was born in baghdad so i am i come from uh, a migrant or um yeah sort of i wasn't born here i lived i grew up here and my family is sort of 
I use them a lot as reference, <laughs> basically for my, for my, for all the work that I do. But it, as as you said, it is about empathy and research, and and not being scared of researching. I mean, sort of working at the moment uh, on a project with Fuel called The Dark, uh, with Royal Alexander Wise, mm. and um, it's a Ugandan piece, and to kind of literally just go straight to a supermarket and start a conversation with Ugandans in London, just to kind of actually, just the smallest of details, I think it's, it's key for a designer to pick up, um, you know, ev anything sort of from, from what the food that's eaten to the fabric that's used. Um, so those kind of little details, I think, are, are key to kind of finding your way into a piece. Um, um, I guess, yeah, I mean, it's just, it is personal experiences as well. And, and, and we're all human. There's going to be sort of that, those kind of conversations that are always had, you know, between us, if you see what I mean. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I guess being the designer for those two shows, it's, it's, I didn't sort of, I didn't think of it. It was more sort of, for me, actually, it's the piece, what, what the piece is trying to say, more than what my role is in that piece. Mm. Um, so, yeah. <coughs> Leo, can we talk about our favourite thing to talk about? Which is, Leo's got a real thing. We were interviewing uh, like a hundred. This is a, this is my favourite thing that's ever happened. Uh, we were interviewing a hundred and five uh, directors in a day uh, for uh, a, a direction opportunity at the Young Vic, and one of the plays um, we were doing is I would say a queer play, not a trans play, and I think that's a really key distinction within the play. And the number of people who were just like, yeah, it's a queer aesthetic, it's really messy. And Leo just getting more and more purple. It was a long day. It was a really long day. And I think about nine hours in, you I snapped. Know. And we're just like, messy, really? Messy, am Tell I? Tell me about that. Do you know what I mean? But there's a really interesting thing, right? Which is about the like, supposed yeah. values of yeah. an aesthetic and like who gets to fucking dictate that. And but, you know, I had a conversation recently with this idea that like it's quintessentially like, uh, Afrofuturist or kind of African aesthetics are assumed to be sort of fertile, do you know what I mean, or of the earth. And I'm like, you ever been to Lagos? It's all fucking electricity and concrete. Do you know what I mean, just like, so what is this like colonial vision of Africa you've all got? But I think there is something about like who gets to dictate yeah. what an aesthetic is. Yeah, I think so, and I think it is about um, is that aesthetic that you are tapping into or using based on. Uh, oppression in some way so like we talk about the messy aesthetic or the DIY aesthetic and actually if you dig into it a little bit not even very far <laughs> then like, sorry, you find like yes cabaret performances, Read a book. Yeah, cabaret performances maybe uh, you might come across them as being messy or DIY because actually they had to be made two minutes very quick you had to get on stage say your political point risk yourself in doing so risk violence to everyone in the room Say what you had to say, make it really quickly, and get off stage before uh, like the police maybe would come in and shut you down uh, and or beat you up and kick everyone out. And so that comes from a place of, uh, we say like, oh, it's, it's made really quickly, or it's made with DIY, and it's like, well, actually, some of the people that made that can't access uh, maybe mainstream employment, so you don't have much money to make it, so you make it yourself. And then you put it on, you've got to make it really quickly and say what you want to say and get off. And actually, that's where that aesthetic potentially, arguably, comes from. And then you have another group of people who are like, okay, I'm going to take that aesthetic and give it a bit of budget, and now it's a thing that everyone has. And I think uh, we just need to interrogate that a bit more. Um, and I also think it is, what is it to take an aesthetic and borrow that and move it into a completely different context? And for me, I would always think, what is it to make, like, think of queer as a verb, so yeah. what is it to make yeah. work queerly rather than a queer aesthetic? So like there is no queer aesthetic, like in my opinion. I think actually what is it to make work queerly is to, what is it to turn something upside down, to look into it, to queer the process of design, to queer the process of rehearsal room, and then you will make queer work because queer isn't something that you can just stick on a t-shirt and be like, everything's really messy. Great. And I think, like, as well, I think with gender, yes, it's messy. And I, I understand that. And I think people come to mess because gender is a bit of a head fuck a lot of the time, I think. And that is, like, a real lived experience of trying to negotiate something that is sticky um, in a very real way. And so, actually, if, if what you're talking about is really sticky and kind of, uh, hard to negotiate then for me um, I would be more interested in like something really 
clear that can allow that to rise and, and be interrogated rather than like just more and more and more and more mm. and less. Mm. Um, and also like why should queer work be that? Like I think actually as well, what is it to interrogate straightness um, or whiteness? Why why don't we interrogate the things that are not said or the things that are not like the absences, I guess. And what is it to But also yeah. that like repeated representation mm-hmm. creates demand. I remember somebody said to David Lann in front of me, um, who I never worked for, so I can find this funny. Uh, but um, he was talking about, you know, and he did, he did amazing work for the representation of, of black writers. And then somebody turned to him and said, yeah, well, when was the last time you did a play where black people didn't sing? And I was like, oh. <laughs> and I was like, that's the shit right there, fucking hell. But I was like, that's a really interesting thing about this. Like, that's what we become used to. We become used to like, hey, and you know, it can be amazing. It can be the most, mm. but there's this expectation. It's like, hey, the black people, they dance and they sing because it's what they're really good at, right? And then you watch, the work of, for example, that scene in Stephen Queen's film, 12, 12 Years a Save, which is otherwise a terrible fucking movie, um, but the scene where Chiotel Fiodor begins to sing a Negro spiritual, and you watch the, exactly that thing you're talking about, which is about, like, this is why black people always sing, because we took everything away from them, and they were left with only their voices. And actually that becomes, like, a real, like, understood moment, you know, and you watch, like, Arthur Jaffer's uh, visual art piece, uh, Love is the Message, the Message is Death, and it's all about that, like, black people are only allowed to prosper at sport and singing. That's pretty much it. Uh, Jeremy, so actually that, that, so now whenever I see a black person singing something, I'm like, oh God. Um, you know, which is why I think in Misty, the most interesting thing to me is where he throws it away. And he says, I don't want to be that song. That. And he's an amazing singer. He's the most amazing singer. And he goes, I don't want to do that because that's a, a form of oppression. That's a form of nipple-based aesthetic, you know, expectation. Um, they're lovely nipples. Uh, sorry. Um, David, do you have anything to show them? I just want to pick up on that messy aesthetic. I, I was really interested in um, one of my other lives is lecturing and teaching design and performance, and off, even in uh, um, both academic institutions and drama schools. And even in those institutions, when I want to keep my job, <laughs> burn uh, your bridges. So there, there are a number of institutions that say where those more radical processes aren't given the spaces and yeah. resources to develop that work right from the very beginning. And actually it's, oh, the actors need this space to do that type of work. And then what happens is that messy aesthetic, they, and, and brilliantly, they're very imaginative. So they'll just be doing it on the streets or in corridors or in the lift or in the toilets. And yes, I think it's really great, but actually if we are thinking about building-based work, particularly in industries, drama schools particularly like to to talk about. We need to think about industry as plural and the different types of industry there are, and also giving room to messiness to become perhaps formalized if you wanted to, and that has another, um, yeah, it's enough. It, it's partly about, yes, okay, you might have a rehearsal process, and who do we get in? Mm-hmm. But actually, we, there, there's, there's not the skills there from the early stages and where they're coming from. There's a problem. Um, and we might have to be more innovative in how we get other people in from different types of industries and consider themselves related to theatre, like a DJ or the other things that can connect. So I think there are we, things we can do, mm. but I think it actually needs to be bottom up and actually what we're doing now, reaching out. But I think, but that's a crazy thing I think about employment in that we expect people to step sideways all the time and like. It takes you fucking years to get your like, do you know what I mean? And it's just like, well, you can't possibly direct on the stage of the Olivia. I'm like, guess what? Give me a chance. I'll do it. Do you know what I mean? Like, do it. I might get it a bit wrong, but I do. And actually, that thing about we don't trust artists who do not have a traditional theatrical background, which means that we end up with the same dry as fuck shit yeah. like all the fucking time. So how do we change our like practices? And this is, I guess, a responsibility for all of us about how do we program work? How do we rehearse work? How do you know? How do we do that? That allows because I think. I think theatre will die a fucking death if we do not begin to embrace the practices around us because as much as we love to pretend that it's all getting like better, right? Most of it's really dry. Uh, and actually like all these other industries are flourishing and making such amazing stuff. So how do we do it? How do we open up our theatrical practice to not be about what I would argue are quite like patriarchal, like goal-driven capitalist imperatives, do you know what I mean? About, like, you will have a press night and you will have sold 50% by then and you need to have locked down the show three days before that. Do you know what I mean? I'm just like, oh, okay, least mm-hmm. creative thing possible. Um, do you know what I mean? Like, how do yeah. we like take that like responsibility uh, into the rest of our practice? Um, yeah, like slightly to link that to some of the other things we're talking about as well. I think um, 
there's a aesthetic responsibility of designers to uh, and everybody in creative teams to not think that particular stories need to be represented in their like realistic setting mm. whatever that is I think um, there's far too much white cis middle class nostalgia on stage in design and I think we need to break out of that and I'm always quite interested in um, abstract symbolism um, on stage because I think it uh, provides different ac access points for different people um, and sort of use an example I guess I uh, co-designed with the lighting designer Jocelyn Gregsby a show um, about the lived experience of moving to a Bruderbus social housing estate in the 1960s and living there through to the point when you know, the funding was pulled from them and um, <coughs> they became what I think a lot of people see in, for instance, like the Channel 4 Ibent um, mm. and these representations of council estates and what, what a lot of people I think think of when people say the term council estate um, for people I, I mean who don't live in council estates and our first rule it was a devised show so we didn't know what the story was yet um, we didn't have a script but our first rule about the design was we are not going to do a realistic representation of that place because it is about the lived experience um, and uh, we wanted a space where you could feel the emotion of those characters and how that space negotiated with them and at times it was a beautiful space and at times it was a harsh space um, for those characters and I think um, yeah it was just like creating that rule and saying I'm not gonna sort of serve <coughs> certain audiences what they think oh they love a grotty kitchen sink exactly oh I've come to see <laughs> the poor people cook I exactly. mean like yeah. genuinely yeah. like that is like, like if you are poor or black or brown and... I want to see your fucking like lino do you yeah. know what I mean like it's that fucking basic yeah. right and to not give them that and say these people are people understand their human story um I think is really important anybody else want anything else we might have to go to the dreaded, like, let's ask some questions or wrap it up. I'm not sure what that gesture was, Tom. Did it mean questions? It meant questions. <laughs> there you go. I was like, does it fucking end it? Uh, does anybody have any questions on anything before we keep rabbiting on? Then we'd be like, no, we've got nothing. There could be small. Wait, wait, look. You're looking hopeful, friend. Yo. Hi, yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you about how you sort of cope with the idea of challenging your audience versus having a safe space, especially something like this. Because there's times Ladies and gentlemen, we have found the smartest person in the world. <laughs> um, right, I'm going home. Uh, <laughs> uh, anybody want to throw in on that? Uh, I was going to say about uh, multiple access points. We talked about it earlier. Different ways of accessing the work, yeah. and bo both uh, intellectually, so actually it can work on a number of levels. That's the joys about site-based work, is it can be feeling-based and it can be multi-sensory, and there are other ways of making that. Often we talk about design as visual, but it is for me it's in, it's embodied in that way. So I think yeah, multiple access points to that work, both conceptually and visually. And I think as well, um, design can change dramatically over the course of a show. Not just scene changes. I think like a static design that doesn't change physically can also change emotionally over the course of a show, um, and in terms of its relationship with the audience and uh, what it communicates to them, the meanings that it communicates to them. Um, and I think you can you can bring audiences in in a comfortable way um, in a way that sort of opens them up um, and and this isn't just design performances too you know you make them laugh and you've got them um, but and then you can kind of twist that and pull the rug from under their feet and um, and then you can bring them back to a safe 
case at the end, you know, you, I think you can manipulate the meanings and emotions of design in that way over the course mm. of a show. Mm. Yeah, so mm. we separate the idea that we could risk running into the idea that there's like challenging work and then there's like accessible work. And I think actually they're one and the same thing. And I would argue that some of the most challenging work is, uh, or like work that pushes you, still remains or is more so uh, inclusive, accessible, welcoming. And actually the work that is challenging, I would probably not be that inclusive. Do you know what I mean? Like I think you, there's an assumption. always like a white cis dude, isn't there's it? Who's like, freedom yeah. of speech. And I'm like, you have no skin in this game. Shut up. Oh, there's um, an assumption that challenging can't be welcoming, accessible, yeah, all those things. And they're totally trying to I think I'm really interested in surprise mm -hmm. as a great, like egalitarian, like, uh, so as a filmmaker, I like to make horror films um, because I'm really interested in horror films as being this like totally egalitarian experience, right? Like Jaws doesn't give a shit whether you're black or white. It just wants to scare the shit out of you. And it does really successfully. My Nana, me, terrified, didn't swim for months. Uh, Joey, and actually I think there's a thing about, and I think that uh, the gross word we never like to talk about, which is marketing, <laughs> uh, in theatre uh, um, has a lot to answer for because it missells the experience before you've ever even made it. And so I'm really interested in like a like not giving pe giving people as little as humanly possible mm -hmm. to get them in there, but like intrigue is a really cool thing. And I think we can learn a lot from horror films as to like how they have visually represented themselves. Like if you think of like the great horror posters, you go, that looks fucking cool. Well, you know, and you don't really know what is it. Mm. Uh, do you know what I mean, like, turns out scary clown. Um, but you know, and that thing, of, and then when you get them in there you surprise the hell out of all of them and actually give nobody the experience that they thought they were going to get. It's a very risky game. Uh, people walk out, people ask for their money back. They can do that, that's fine. But I just think that thing of, like, we've all been in those spaces where people like virtue signal how comfortable they are, generally the sort of like the ho-hos of like, I saw this coming, you know, all that stuff. And so I think, I think the only really equal thing is to just say nobody, but that's sort of contrary actually to like, how do I create something that's safe and welcoming? So maybe it's impossible and we should all quit. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's not do it. Can we turn the recording off? Uh, I didn't say that. Um, anybody else? For anything else? Mm. Everyone's like, do you know what? I don't care about design and identity. It's cool. We've solved the problems of the world. You were looking at me really hopefully, I want to say. <laughs> you didn't you were looking like, I'm yeah. like... An interesting thing that I have to do that on set. Like, I went to um, a talk with Rizal and he was talking about how there's a kind of constant conflict Specificity, you know, is he a leading man or is he a brown leading man? And so do you create a ceiling for how much within institutions um, your accessibility of your story can reach wider audiences if you frame it as a black story, a brown story, a, a queer story? Or should we also frame them as, you know, should barbershop be a story about masculinity, not about black masculinity? Should black man be a superhero story, not a black superhero story? And that conflict was created in designers of how much should you own your specificity is not a question but it's what I'm kind of trying to that's a very valid question my friend does yeah. anybody yeah. jump in because I could talk about this for fucking days yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I could talk about resolvement for days but that's a different conversation yeah. for another time but um, anybody want to jump in on that no no because no, I'll just, I'll just <laughs> keep going <laughs> <laughs> you're okay with that mm -hmm. All right, I'm just going to rev me up and watch me go. Uh, I think that to, to assume that as a brown man you can ever just be a man assumes a parity of access that does not exist. And if I park my blackness at the front door, I'm kidding myself because if I walked in this room and you had to, let's say I walked in this room and I got shot. Don't know why that happened, let's say it happened. Uh, and you had to describe the moment to the police. To say that you would not describe me as being a black woman is incredibly, like, it's just, it's just not true. Who hit you? That black woman. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's an identifying thing about me. And I think to, to, to move to a, like, oh, I'm just a leading man is a little bit, we're all one race, the human race. And, that, and that's just not, no. our experiences are totally different. I do not have the same access to any form of uh, experience or opportunity that, Another, you know, and I'm incredibly privileged in many, many ways, but you know, let's just click on race as a good thing. Um, and so I just, I think that we can only have specificity because our, our cultures, our histories, our stories have been oppressed. Do you know what I mean? And they have been oppressed consciously. 
not unconsciously. I mean, we, it has been decided for hundreds of years that we were not good enough. And that, you know, what's bonkers to me? Sorry, I'm absolutely revved up. I'm going to go now. What's crazy to me uh, is that I moved to this country when I was 14. And when I was growing up in Sudan, I was learning the history of China and Mexico and Germany. And, like, and you come here and it's like the only two countries that ever existed were Germany and Russia. Germany, you know I mean? like, what the fuck is that? And what's crazy to me is like when my nan's from in Bradford, I was like that you had like schools that were 90% Asian, uh, you know, Indian Pakistani who were not being taught the, 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 the intersection of their own history with British culture. And I was just like, huh, this is a fucking decision. Um, and so for, I do not acknowledge the, ter the term colorblind casting. Um, I, I just think it's a fucking fallacy invented by white people. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, to again, pretend that, you know, the conscious uh, extermination of our narratives and the oppression of our peoples. Like, it's all cool now. We're sorry for colonialism. Uh, you know I mean, like, anyway, sorry, that's me. Whew! Um, you were say. Yeah, so I, I agree. Um, and he was saying, in the reaction Kenny was giving, he was saying he thought that he was extending the definition of what a leading man looks like, or just extending the definition of what Brown looks like. Um, and so that's why it was successful. Well, I'm actually thinking, is it, are we actually extending the mindset of existing audiences, or are we just bringing new audiences in? And because the former feels like, if it's the latter, then I feel like we're always going to be in a place of, it's always, it feels very aggressive, it doesn't feel very utopian, it doesn't feel like, oh, institutions are up, opening their gates, and so that, that that is a small place and we have to create our own spaces. And one is more pessimistic than the other, and so that's sort of the tension that I feel like it's expressing. Yeah, but I'm, I'm interested in, and, and I don't think I want to speak to this, that idea that creating spaces that are, like, nothing gets white people up, like, backs up. Like, when you refer to them as being white, as being totemically white, that there is a white identity, do you know what I mean? Uh, and, but they refer to a black identity or Asian identity all the fucking time, do you know what I mean? And, like, you know, what do I have in common with a West Indian? I'm from fucking East Africa, do you know what I mean? Like, X, Y, and Z. But I think that, that whole sense of, if you create a safe that is space for a minority of people, that you are somehow excluding the majority is really problematic because we have grown up watching their plays, their films, their television, and we fucking love them. Do you know what I mean? I fucking love Richard Linklater films. That's my fucking jam. They're white as shit, and he's from Texas. Like, there is not a Latino in his movies. What the fuck? Um, but actually, the idea that if we tell our own stories, that that is somehow ex exclusionary. We, well, actually, here's, here's a little secret. We're the global majority. <laughs> I mean, it's like the greatest con of whiteness was to convince us that they were a superior race. Sorry, I've all, I've gotten very political now. But um, <laughs> but do you know what I mean? That thing about like what that is, I think, conceived by some straight people that like queer spaces are somehow exclusionary to straightness rather than being welcoming to all. But they cannot bear that critique on majority held power, right? <laughs> so everyone's just like, I just want peace. <laughs> I'm all about the love. No, it's, it's very difficult because I've, uh, I've had yeah, uh, several experiences where I've been called up and sort of hired for having a foreign name. Let's tick, let's tick that box. Um, what, what is difficult is, is having those opportunities, but we're talking about audi diverse audiences as well. Um, I guess culturally it's it's going actually it's okay to be brown and the arts that you know for me that's my personal battle it was actually to go no I can I can go and you know make a living out of it I don't need to be an accountant or an engineer um, and then you realize you would have made a much better living as an accountant mm -hmm. you like, should have been an accountant <laughs> exactly. right. I do, have a, we just about I do this. have a maths degree as well by the way so and then you could still be an accountant <laughs> run Roger run <laughs> run come on <laughs> But, it's um, miserable and it's full of racists. <laughs> Sorry. No, but it, it, there is something about the work. I think it's, it's if, you, if you open up the work itself, um, you know, getting those audiences is, 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 is amazing. Um, you know, and for me, it is about the love. You, know, you, might, you might say otherwise, but um, yet to being sort of accessible on, on all levels, to be quite honest with you, it's, it's just sort of it's, it's finding those moments to get in there and, and just kind of go, yep. Yeah, that's that's what it is. That's what this piece needs, and this is what the character is, and it is in everybody. So, um, I, yeah, I'm a bit of a pacifist and a bit of a hippie at heart, but I, I, yeah, I have faith in what the arts is and what the what the theatre world is. So, um, eventually, we'll get there. <laughs> so it's you know, like people like Riz are doing. They're doing a Lord's work. We're not mm -hmm. saying they don't. We're just saying that 
mm. I, well, for me personally, that like there is a difference between one, you know, every 10 years or so, the industry, the creative industries as a whole have a collective like spasm, spasm of consciousness, you know, where they're like, oh no, we had an Oscar so white, better employ some black and brown people. Uh, and uh, careers are made, and that's awesome. That's an amazing thing. But like serious systemic change means that there can be more than one Riz. <laughs> I mean, God forbid there could be 10 Rizzes, et cetera, et cetera. I guess it's like that. It's, you're not saying that, or oh, I don't feel like that, I'll tease myself. I don't feel like I'm saying no uh, white cis het person can have the chance to make narratives. It's more mm. like just not every chance. Mm. And I think it's uh, also for the first time, maybe white cis het people are having to look in other narratives or other theatres or other stories to see themselves. And actually, that's no bad thing to. You know, I feel like I can watch a straight, straight film and still get something from it. It's not like mm. I only want queer audiences to see my work. I want lots of people to see my work. And actually, if I watch a film, you have to like, you know, so very so few films are trans narrative films. And if they are, they're probably not that great. And so it's like you have to like bend yourself to when you watch something and you still get something from it. And I guess it's like we I don't feel like we're in a time now where we can be pacifist like I feel like now is not that time and maybe maybe there will be a time when the, it is that time but right now like I think in America like trans people are being erased from um, like government le le legislation <laughs> now and I just feel like I I can't be a pacifist now and actually like yeah it's like every every act that we make is a political act and every story that we choose to uh, say or you know what stories get put on what stories don't is an is a political act that we have to take on as artists and as people and like yeah like and if you're not part of that community like what is it to be an ally to that community mm -hmm. in a very active sense and if you're not dismantling uh, the privileges of, of of one group or you're not actively uh, uh, yeah instigating change then like you're part of you're part of it, and like we have to do something. I feel I feel like there's a real pressure, um, because otherwise, like you kind of take it for granted that we're on some sort of continuum of like progressiveness, but it's just not the case. Like, and in America, yeah, even now it's been like they're voting on like some of the votes that we that the rights that trans people have just got have now been <coughs> put away, and it's like you think that you're on some sort of like trajectory, but you're really not, and we have to like fight and stand up and be counted for every story that goes on stage and every uh, film that is made and book that is shared and everything i feel it now more than ever really and that is a brilliant place to start. <laughs> <laughs> thank you leo for bringing it home <laughs> thank you all very much that was really fun <laughs>